so Tim, this is going to be an interview that we're going to put out as part of a little series called Jordan Peterson and the Left, or What Can the Left Learn from Jordan Peterson? Mm -hmm. We got in contact first because you wrote the first, I think the first spectator profile of Jordan Peterson at about the same time as I brought out my documentary. And you've described yourself as an old lefty. Um, so I think it's really interesting to kind of to, to, to pull that apart, kind of where, what is, have the reactions been to what you've put out there? What, have you gone on a journey with all of that stuff? Um, and, and what do you find kind of really enticing about Jordan Peterson? Um, so I um, am from a working class background in London. Um, I was a journalist when I started off. Then I started writing books. I've also worked in the meantime as a journalist for The Guardian primarily. I've been a columnist on The Guardian f until the end of last year. But I've always seen The Guardian as my natural home. I've read The Guardian for as long as I can remember, so that I'm certainly a leftist to that extent. Mm. And we pretty much probably discovered Jordan Peterson at more or less the same time, maybe. Or had you oh, I think I was first. Yeah, you, you've <laughs> known him a bit before. Well, I don't know. I was, I was, I was, I, w I don't even remember how I came across Jordan Peterson other than in the context because uh, one thing I haven't said about my career is I now as well as write books teach writing and I've been studying how stories are generated and the shapes of stories and the structure of stories and that's how I came across Jordan Peterson way before we got into this whole debate which has somehow got all entangled with politics which I've never seen Peterson primarily as a political figure. I mean, I know people interpret him that way, and in some ways he is a political figure, but that's kind of not what interests me about him. What interests me about Peterson is, is a purely professional interest in some ways, is his understanding of where stories come from and why we need them and how they are laid out in our imaginations both psychologically and in terms of the culture, in other words, in films, in theatre, um, in whatever, in novels. I mean, you know, if, I, if, if my practical question was, if I can crack the problem of what makes for a compelling story, it's going to make me a better novelist, you know, and, and I'll be able to use that tool and teach that tool. And Jordan gives some brilliant lectures on stories, whether they're the Lion King or whether they're Hamlet, uh, or, or, or whether they are um, the Bible. But well, I'll get to the Bible. But he, the, the smaller stories, like Pinocchio, you know, these modern fables. He start, you know, that was his starting point, as it were. And uh, I followed all those stories. His analysis of these stories, Beauty and the Beast, being another one, Pocahontas. You know, he was. I mean, his, his analysis of Pinocchio was particularly brilliant, you know, and I, I've, um, I've tried to, you know, I've read Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, Eric Fromm, you know, who wrote uh, The Uses of Enchantment about children's stories. I've always been gripped by the idea that there's a kind of underlying story bubbling up in us all, that, that we're, as artists, trying to somehow inflect in our own way, but it's always, in some senses, the same story. And if it is the same story, what does that story mean? What is that story? Why does that make us moved or interested or involved? And that's where I think Jordan Peterson is absolutely fascinating. He's fascinating about how the individual, well, he's a psychologist, and it's the, uh, how, how this thing works with respect to psychology. And the most important thing for me, quite apart from his work with you know, these stories, of modern myths, was, as you say, his investigation into the Bible. And I've always been fascinated, although I'm an atheist, I've always been fascinated by the power of the biblical stories. I've often found myself looking at these huge cathedrals and churches that sprouted up all over Europe, you know, and uh, and I asked myself, well, what's that about? You know, why was this story so powerful? I mean, yeah, it's a defence against death if you want to be cynical, but hey, you know, it could be lots of other stories, you know, and why, why is this one so unbelievably powerful? And what does it mean for it to be so powerful? And Peterson, I think, brilliantly answers that question in the biblical lectures. 
he's done. And he really changed me, those lectures. He genuinely did, I think, change the way I lived my life. Because he came to this very, very important conclusion, which I'm pretty convinced by. I don't think I'm ever 100% convinced by anything. But I'm very convinced by his idea, as I've, I've, I'm someone who's suffered depression, and depression is like a crisis of meaning in your, in your and it's the worst thing about depression, it's not about being miserable, it's being, having a life that seems utterly meaningless, and, and that's why it's such torment. And Peterson, in a way, tries to answer the question, how do we as an individual, that's a bit of a paradox, how do I as an individual, acquire meaning because meaning is the most important thing any of us could have you know there's meaning is it you know if you don't know and yet no one can quite say what meaning is which i think is interesting in itself you know, everyone says well i want a sense of meaning well, what is a sense of meaning what is meaning and peterson i think acknowledges that mystery but also says well you know if you want a sense of meaning it's not about just doing what you want. It's not about just following your bliss, as Joseph Campbell would be, or, or, or having as much fun as possible, or, or even necessarily being... Happy. No, absolutely not, not necessarily being happy. It's, there are more important things than being happy, and, and I've also found that to be true in my life. I'm 62 now and I've been through a lot, you know, and I found that many things, that unhappiness has given me so much, you know, unhappiness has given me so much in terms of, in terms of meaning. Trying to pick through the bones out of one's unhappiness is what one enriches you. And that's the story that is the story of nearly all great stories. That, that, that suffering is a way of raising yourself above your animal condition, if you choose to let it be. And that the suffering that involves in a change in yourself, and this is what we teach in story narrative, which all great stories are about a change of one condition into another condition. And that's what makes a story compelling. It's this making this change and the, 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 the pursuit of this goal of change is what actually, what we mean when we talk about meaning. That somehow to aim for something higher than yourself, even if you can't quite name it. I mean, I would use, you know, that aim, the word for that aim as authenticity, maybe. That's one of the words I might use to try and discover my own goal, is to be an authentic person, to be a real person. Because I had a very strong sense when I was younger that I wasn't very real, that I was kind of two-dimensional, that I was a bit like a cardboard cutout and I could be blown away by the wind at any moment. And my experience of life, I'm going through a fair bit of suffering, I would say, as everybody does, but I think I've probably had, you know, a, probably some worse experiences than, than some better experiences than other. Um, that, this, that this suffering has forced me to engage with what it means to be alive and has enriched me in some sense. And that struck a very loud chord when I, you know, not that I in any way glamorise, so I don't think anyone should seek out suffering, you know, but, but I, I was very taken by Peterson's message that life is, it's not about being happy, life is about suffering. Okay, well that sounds a bit it's a bit eeyore in this day and age, when a lot of people have a very pleasant life, you know, and they don't really suffer that much. And I get that, you know, you can have a very nice life. It's just not a very deep life. You know, it's just not a very profound or resonant life. And somehow, in my experience, when I meet people who've been through really lousy crap, somehow they're kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, they're more interesting, they're richer, they're deeper. But they may be, and others might just be, you know, might have done the wrong thing with that stuff and become just boring assholes, you know. But I mean, but it gives you an, a strange opportunity because when you're, you know, in a, in a crisis, you have to question your life very deeply and you have to say, what's gone wrong? Now, as Peterson would point out, a, a very common response to that is 
Someone else did that to me. Society did that to me. The ruling class did that to me. Men did that to me. Women did that to me. White people did that to me, you know. And there's something in that. But it's not really a sufficient, or in my case, you know, as a working class boy, not very working class anymore, you know, the, 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 the ruling class, the wealthy people, the upper class did that to me, you know, deprived me of a decent education, deprived me of any material pleasures when I was up until I made my own money, you know. Um, and, uh, but it's not, you know, and I, but, but I, I, I really have a gut, resistance perhaps again from my background as a kind of sort of respectable working class self-help kind of ethic that it doesn't do you any good even if it's true to cast yourself in that role your story is not going to be a very good one it's not going to be a very nourishing one if you put yourself in that role it might be easy it might be in in, in, in short term you know, it's rather like junk food, a junk thought. It's like, oh, it's all their fault. Yeah, it's a little bit their fault, but as Peter says, it's also a little bit your fault. And maybe it's a lot your fault, you know, and, and you've got to watch that thought because if you're depressive like I am, you know how that can flip over into a kind of acute pathological guilt about sort of, you know, I'm the worst person in the world because everything's my fault. And I think that's a danger. I've spoken to Jordan about this, about this idea that, you know, this, this, this idea of intense personal responsibility, which he advocates. I'm not so much with him on that. You know, I think you, could, you can get a bit carried away. But I do think the modern left has lost, lost touch with that essential liberal trope that we as human beings at our deepest level are individual souls that are of value you know and that we have an intrinsic instinct as it were for morality and that morality is important and that's the modern project let's not think about it you know and let's get on with our lives let's buy our iphones let's stay on the online let's watch love island but let's not think about it because actually it's not really a soluble problem and, you know, it's all about power anyway, blah de blah de blah Well, you know, maybe it is a soluble problem. And I think Jordan Peterson is, is, is the first person in some ways. Not the first person. There are other people. Alan Watts is one of them. And, uh, and Joseph Campbell's another. Who've, who've really, you know, and Jung, um, are people who've really approached that question. But I'm not a great one for distracting myself from the big problems of life because I wouldn't be a very good novelist if I was. No. But with that territory goes a lot of uncertainty and fear, and 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 just the two go together, and um, and 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 yet also fascination and meaning. And I I guess I have a similar take. And why after I interviewed Jordan in October last year, I then kind of thought, okay, I want to turn this into a documentary, precisely because. I had a real sense of how important and how meaningful his message was, and I had already got this this real uh, impression that it was being lost on a lot of people because they couldn't get past the political stuff. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And so I, that's why I made I made it into the documentary that I did was to sort of to try and create because it's so impenetrable. I mean, where do you start with Jordan Peterson? There's yeah. all of these lecture series. There's so many different ways in, uh, or there's so many difficult ways in because you've got to watch so much of it to understand. And so I tried to make this documentary to kind of I, I guess I already had in the back of my mind a lot of my progressive friends and their kind of reactivity to what he was saying and to, to try and say, no, no, look at what he's actually saying. Look at the kind of Jungian underpinnings. Look at the story. Look at the, the, the deeper message of what he's, what he's doing. And I guess it's, it's been a constant kind of... I found myself in that conversation so often. Of, and, I, I mean, we, we, both, we both feel like the political lens is probably not the right one to look at Jordan Peterson through, but it's almost impossible in this highly politicised world not to kind of look at him through that lens, or at least for him to be pulled into that frame all the time. Um, so I'm interested as a fellow, like we both probably consider ourselves at least or coming from the left. Yes. Um, so I'd love to hear, have you, have you had arguments with people? Many, you... many arguments, but I've kind of given up, you know, because... 
and it's really been quite depressing in a way. I mean, I, when I, you know, when I, when one tries to, and this is really one of the things that Peterson rails against, and I think very rightly, is that when one tries to engage with people on certain subjects, they're not really, they're very resistant to um, discussion. They'll rather just start shouting at you or accusing you that the, you're being, you know, a fascist or something or a sexist or something, you know. Or they'll throw personal abuse at you. And, and, and instead of saying, yeah, OK, all right, well, you might not find this a very attractive book. What's your answer? What's your rational, you know, I mean, if, if Jordan Peterson has a meta study showing that men and women are fundamentally different in the way they behave in all cultures and there are like hundreds of studies that all show the same thing what do you say to that you know I mean I don't think it's politically sexist well that's what they say to that but it's like why is that sexist I mean you, you know you don't you know it's it's it, it, it isn't sexist at all to me to say that men and women might and you know you only have to say might to get into big trouble might have different inborn proclivities and this is the reason it's so taboo is because the social constructionist view has so gripped the left and I thought it had died you know at the end of the coming down of the Berlin Wall and the failures of Maoism and the failures of uh, the failures of, of communism generally which is a whole which is embedded in a whole mindset you know Marxism and later post-Marxism I didn't say that when I was at university I studied political science. So, like Jordan, I studied totalitarianism and I studied the Russians and I studied how the mindset worked. And it was terrifying. Like him, I just thought this is terrifying. But I thought it had gone, you know? I, I thought that was dead. But what I've seen it is, is it being... It's recru recrudescence through the academy, through the universities, suddenly it's back. The difference is they don't know it's Marxism or they call it postmodernism. You know, but in fact, it's the idea that only power matters, that there's no absolute truths, that all truths are relative. This to me is garbage. You know, I mean, it's, I mean you, can, you can make an intellectual argument about it, but it's still very patently not true. You know, that, that, that some values, don't tell me that dignity isn't a real thing. Don't tell me that respect isn't a real thing. Don't tell me that love isn't a real thing. You know, that it's all power. It's not true. You know, I know it because I know my inner self. And my final point of reference is my inner self, my soul, if you want to use religious terminology, though I'm not religious, but my soul is where I look for my final authority not to the group that I belong to, or not to the group that anybody else belongs to. I'm not interested in that. I mean, I'm vaguely interested, and I recognise it has a, a, a part to play. But finally and fundamentally, it's the individual that matters. And how could I think anything otherwise as a writer? If any job is about the individual voice, it's the job of the novelist. You know, if, you know films are collective projects. Writing a novel is the ultimate individual act, the ultimate individual voice. And even that is coming under pressure now. You know, people, are, they have, they have um, I think they're called something like, they're not called morality readers, but they're, they're something diversity like... Diversity reader? Diversity readers. They have editors now who check, you know, that you don't have any inappropriate, you don't have any inappropriate opinions in your you know, even for your characters. That's a really deep sickness as far as I'm concerned. That is, that is totalitarian thought. And it's totalitarian thought, not in the government, but it's the totalitarian thought mindset that I see on the march. It hasn't expressed itself in government yet. We're still to basically a pluralist society. But that mindset that's, I know what's right. And you, if you don't agree with me, are wrong. Um, and what I love about Peterson is that he says you don't know anything. You know, you're very small. 
the world is very big and you can't possibly grasp it. So have some bloody humility. You know, and I think that's so true because the world is incredibly complex and we all have to construct stories around it. But very few of us seem to have the courage to say, I don't know what the hell is going on. And I'm just little me. So let's listen to each other and try and work out what the hell is going on. But people are so scared of the chaos that that involves, that the sheer magnitude of the problem, if you like, that they retreat into these little rigid narratives and say, well, that's the way things are, you know, and I hate that. I mean, I really viscerally hate that. The idea that people insist out of fear of the complexity of the world, and it's understandable, but you know, it leads to hell, it leads to Auschwitz, and it leads to the gulags. You know, once you are too scared of reality, and reality after all, especially with the rise of the internet, has revealed itself to be so complex, that the more complex it is, the more terrified we become, the more out of control the world seems to be, the more we retreat to our bunkers of certainty, and yet, you know, if, if, you, if being human means anything in a kind of mentally evolutionary sense, it's tolerance of uncertainty. It's to be able to say, I don't know, let's work it out. And if you can't do that, what have we got? We've got totalitarianism. So I'm very much with Jordan Peterson on that. All the stuff about women, I mean, I think all that's... Uh, and, 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 the, and the post, I mean, I think he's right about the postmodernists. I think he's right about the Marxists. I think he's quite right. So whether they're as quite as powerful as he thinks they are, I don't know. But, you know, I think he's, he's, he's identified a really, a really clear and present danger. And he's had the courage to stand up for it because I was talking to you before we, the cameras were running is that the trouble with the postmodern neo Marxist line is that it invariably puts you on the defensive. The moment they come at you with these ideas, you're a racist, you're a sexist, you're a misogynist, you're LBGT averse, whatever, you know, you're Islamophobe, you know, the whole dialogue is about putting you on the back foot and making you feel, oh, I, I'm a bad person, I should shut, I know, all right, maybe you can go away and go, all right, I'm not going to engage with you, you know, you think I'm a bad person. But the point is you start to shut down, you start to be scared you know, to express your view. And I think that's you're very also, dangerous. Yeah, and you also drew some really interesting parallels with the show trials in communism and this sort of sense of, we've all got this internalised sense of, well, there's something, I've done something wrong at some point. That all of these, even the Spanish Inquisition, and like they, I think that's, that's the sort of truth that pretty much every great inquisitor has come to. It's like everyone has an internalised sense of shame around something. If you can find, if you yeah. can tap into that, Everybody wants to confess, you know, and, and be, uh, their, their sin because they feel that they've done something wrong. I don't know if it comes out of childhood or some ancestral inheritance, but everybody uh, deep in their heart feels they've done something it's wrong. The Christian idea of original sin. It's yes, like, yeah. it is. It's, it's, it's certainly akin to that, you know. And that need, and one of the most loathsome and pathetic spectacles I, I see is, um, is, is people desperately. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry I said that, you know. I'll never say it again, because that just makes them even worse the moment. You, but, 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 you know, it's sort of groveling that goes on for people speaking what they see as their truth. But that is, that is really under threat, I think. And, and it's not, and it's self-censorship, and it's, it's by cutting, you know, the BBC, which I've always been a huge admirer and supporter of. I, I think there's something in the idea that they're, agenda has become narrow and narrow and narrow and you know they're thinking within very small boxes now and I'm very reluctant to align myself with say the Daily Mail which I loathe, detest and despise, let me make that absolutely clear. But the idea that there's a kind of bias within the, within the, in the BBC, I think it's hard to argue against it, you know I think they are quite within that sort of cultural framework, you know you kind of know what they're going to say before they say it. There's not a real, there's not a real, which is why the intellectual dark web is, 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 is developing so powerfully, is because the national broadcaster is not giving us those genuine, honest, inquisitorial conversations that they're used to. You know, all, all we're really getting is, 
this is what the BBC, although they would never put it that way, this is what our collective view is on morality. It goes back to the Reithian idea that we have to educate the public mm. because they kind of fear the mob, you know, and that's, that's something I, again, coming from a working class background, I don't see the mob to be feared. You know, I, all the working class people I knew, although they didn't have very appropriate opinions, were very decent, good people, you know, and, and much better than, than their so-called betters, you know, morally. So I don't have that fear of the mob. I trust people to be good people. But there's still that sort of elitist idea that, you know, if we don't sort of educate these, these plebs out of their, out, out, out of their um, you know, nativism, you know, they're all going to be marching up and down giving Nazi salutes and, you know, and beating up their wives. And that's just nonsense, I think. There's a, yeah, there's so many things there to pick up on, like really interesting, because one of the things that you often hear is people on the left saying, oh, well, he talks about cultural Marxism, there's no such thing. Um, and what you're expressing is, yeah, there's cultural Marxism, Sorry. there's cultural Marxism in, in, in literature already, because people are, and, and I think, I, I feel this as well, like it's almost, it's almost, it's far more than politics. Like the most chilling effect is being had at the level of the dialogue of what's allowed to be said yes. and what's not allowed to be said. Yes. And that I think is, is where we both sort of share, myself as a journalist, you, you as a novelist, both share a lot of concerns around what it means if you've got a, a, a public space where certain things are not allowed to be said. I feel incredibly passionate about that, you know. I mean, I just think, again, as a novelist, I've got to be, I've got to be allowed to be wrong, you know, without even, be, without being accused of being, you know, 27 different things that are all, to some extent or other, evil or, you know, to be disapproved of. The point is, I, you know, I've got to have my characters be able to express the way real people are. You know, I can't just say, this is the way they should be, because that's the death of literature, you know, and that's why literature and arts in Russia died the moment the communists took over, you know, from a wonderful, rich history of literature and art, suddenly dead, you know, and... Uh, same with Maoism, you know, I mean, I don't know about the history of Chinese culture. I've got no idea. It's a very different culture. And now they seem to be emerging out of it in some ways, you know. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's terrifying for an artist what is happening. And what's particularly terrifying about it is quite a lot of artists are signing up to it. You know, they're, they're signing up for the sort of, you know, I, I was most shocked of all. I know mean, there are some shocking things that have happened in the... Uh, in, the, in my lifetime. I was certainly on the subject of the 7-7 bombings in London. I was shocked, and Salman Rushdie, how many of the, my so-called left colleagues, as it were, were apologists for what was happening, simply because they were anti-America and therefore anything that sort of, you know, anything that... Uh, and also cultural Marxism supposes that all cultures are equal which I think is rubbish. I just don't think that all cultures are equal. I think some cultures are like... Cultures are like people. Some are better than others, you know, some are nicer than some are crueler than others, some are more noble than others, some are more, you know, they're, they're, like, they're just like people, as Plato observed, you know, and uh, I, I think the idea that everything has a kind of equal value, I, I, I was going to say the most disgraceful moment of artists betraying their trade to me was when the Charlie Hebdo massacres took place and the American pen you know, after the award was given to Charlie Hebdo for the extraordinary bravery. I mean, my God, you know, he knew they were in the front line of, 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 uh, of Islamic State at that time. They knew it, you know, and they went on publishing. And not just, you know, because they took the, the mickey out of uh, Islam as they did with everything else. You know, that's what they did. They were sort of the private eye of France, you know. And that the, the American writers stood there and refused to turn up for that ceremony because they disapproved of Charlie Hebdo. That made me want to be sick. I mean, I was so disgusted by those. And they, these are writers. These are writers that people should be right at the heart of free expression, you know, and, and that they are selling that out, I think, is shocking beyond belief. There's, yeah, there's two things here. One, I've talked about, especially, because you, you can look at this sort of, wave of cultural Marxism and sort of what people can say and what they can't say and all of this sort of media media um, creation as okay we we don't like it 
But you can also look at it as it's backfiring tremendously. Look at Trump, look at Brexit. For me, those Absolutely. two things Absolutely. Were, were direct responses to what I've kind of called the shadow of liberalism. This sort of, this feeling of it, inclusivity that includes only people that sign up to this, 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 and this. And anyone who doesn't think like that is a bigot, is a... Yes. And, and I think especially in America, this is what created this is what's created the political backlash that we're seeing in the UK and the US. And this is I, I cannot understand how progressives or supposed progressives cannot see this. That some of them are now sort of doubling down and like, oh wow, well it's far worse than we thought. That they, they must be these people must be awful. Even awful more people. evil than we thought they were. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yet before the, the American election you had Milo Yiannopoulos, who is an openly gay man who talks about his black boyfriends getting mobbed uh, like these are not personally or these are not personally bigoted people this is this is something that that d didn't fit with the kind of narrative well, that's it that, and that people i mean i don't know much about milo but i i, I so I'm using I, that as one example but i mean of, i do think yeah. that it's interesting that, that i think a lot of a lot of a lot of um manifestations are appearing of political philosophies both in political parties um, and sort of on the ground, as it were, that just don't fit anybody's particular narrative. The, the terms right and left do not really apply very well anymore. I can finally quite find it hard to put myself on that spectrum mm. anymore. I don't really know what it means anymore. Mm. You know, and it's why I think there's this, this terrible panic to get Jordan Peterson in the right wing, you know, because, you know, he's not right wing. You know, he's, he's not any wing. He's a thinker that has a lot of his own ideas. And you, you know, I mean, the, the Kathy Newman interview being a hilarious version of, you know, that's the most transparent version, I think, of, of what we were talking about, of people trying to be forced into a box, you know, by the dominant narrative. So what you're saying narrative. is... So what I'm saying... <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's very insidious. It's very dangerous, I think. I, I think something's changing, but I don't know what, and I don't know how fast, and I don't know what's going to happen, you know? But I do think Jordan Peterson is someone who's had a lot of guts to stand up for, against, if you like, people who do not want to have this conversation, you know? And he's just saying, let's have the conversation. And he's got his point of view. Fair enough. Argue with him. Don't call him, you know, don't try and flush him down the toilet because he's a, a devil. You know, it's, it's ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know where, we're, where this is all going to take us, David. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic. But as you say, things are changing and there are, there are shifts happening under the surface. Yeah. Where they're leading, I don't know. They could be leading to populism. They could be leading to, you know, they could be leading to a kind of mob rule. Certainly that's what happened with, with Brexit to a certain extent. Um, they could be in, empowering the elites. They could be leading to the, the breaking up of the post-modernist, neo-Marxist standpoint. Or they could be increasing it. I don't really know. No one seems to know. It's just like, there was a very interesting Adam Curtis short film the other day it suggested that the powers that be if they exist these powers that be as opposed to it just being a chaotic slithering of different interest groups the powers that be are almost willfully turning the narratives into snake pits of chaos because it just makes you go oh well because you don't know what else to do but go oh well i don't know you know, and, and I, I've many times been hit by that. Just, this is, I can't deal with this anymore. I don't know what the hell's happening. You know, I just can't make sense of this anymore. And I think, you know, one could say, okay, that's just, that's just a phase that we're going through and we'll come out of it. Or you could say, actually, there are, there's intelligences behind it that are actually conspiring to make the world a more confusing, contradictory, and therefore manipulable place and I don't I don't know I mean I'm confused you know but at least I'm not afraid to admit that I'm confused which helps
Maybe, <laughs> maybe. I guess, I guess for me, the way that I can frame it is to just pull this apart. It's like you can have, and I, and I, I wonder if I'd, I'd like to hear sort of maybe Jordan Peterson framing it in this way as well, because I do think like one of my criticisms of him would be that he certainly comes across as speaking in a very combative way when he talks about the left. Yeah. That I think is not going to help um, convert people. Like I think, I think it, it, he's almost been like roped in to one side of the culture war, and I think partly, partly that's that he just, just keeps being dragged down to the political level by by people who are interviewing him. But what I'd love to hear him say is something like, "Okay, these values that you hold so dear, equality, um, don't know if he could bring himself to say diversity, but certainly fairness, fairness as a value. These are good values, but if you make them your primary axioms." then you're in trouble. You're basically, every lesson from history shows that if you make fairness your primary determinant of a political system, you just end up in chaos, or you end up in, you end up in, in hell almost immediately. Well, well, that's one of the issues I have with Jordan Peterson, is that I think it's true that if you make fairness of outcome, if you like, um, the uh, political aim, then you are in trouble. But I do believe in fairness, and I do believe that, that the system, as it were, is run in favour of the rich and powerful, and I do believe that the system has to be, to some extent, moderated by the state. You know, I, mean, I grew up at a time when I was saved by the National Health Service. I was a very sickly baby. I was able to go to university and received a grant for it at the age of 27. You know, I, I, I went to a grammar school, you know, a good school from a working class area. My, the benefits of, of the state intervening to promote fairness is not something I'm against. But I can't get down with equality of outcome. I can certainly get down with equality of opportunity. And I think Peterson's the same. But I think he's, he's spent too much time, I think, trying to be... Uh, sort of an apathe le bourgeoisie, you know, person who's just going to go. I don't care if you don't like what I say. You know, he's got a bit. He's got a bit drunk on that, I think. You know, and he might want to enter. It's not for me to say what you know he should do, but he, it would be wise, I think, if he could, you know, perhaps, like as you say, talk about. And he has talked about. It. He has talked about fairness. He does talked about the proper role of the left wing. He has talked about. The fact that you know there is a place for that, but he's just very hidden, you know. And I think he might want to, he might want to, you know, rather than be led all the time by what other people try to lead him into this, into this snake pit of not very healthy narratives. To say no, let's look at this side. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I, and this is why I, I, this is where I doubt sometimes doubt how much he has invested in the idea of, you know, shall we say. I mean, you said he, he supports quality of opportunity, for instance, you know, OK, well, I'm completely down with that. But you don't really hear that from him very much, you know, and it'd be, he should shout it from the rooftops. You know, he should if he's got liberal and, and leftist credentials, if you want to call it that way, he should be shouting them from the rooftops. And, you know, he doesn't very much. You know, I think he's, you know, he's he's quite anti-statist as well as being anti but he supports a, you know, he supports a public health system. He supports the national health, for instance, you know, which they have in Canada. I mean, it's not what, you know, it's not what the neoliberals want to do. It's not what the conservatives want to do. They want to strip back the state to nothing. So he's a much more nuanced thinker politically than he allows himself to be presented as, because he's got, got he's got very very overexcited perhaps by the idea of smashing down the canards of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the radical left. I think for me, it's this kind of realisation that what started as really valuable contributions on the left, like marginalised voices being heard, um, a view of the people who are being left out of society, all that sort of stuff, and, and which is essential, has turned into something of a religion. And I think a lot of people are, are starting to realise that it is actually being seen as a religion and that blaspheming against it in any way or being seen as a blasphemer against it in any way 
is is incredibly toxic or is incredibly it, it, it's it's a career ending accusation to be thrown mm. at someone which is now starting to put certain topics off off yeah. off limits and that's very toxic very yeah. toxic yeah, indeed um Yes, the, the human mind is a religious mind. I mean, we think religiously. We don't think rationally. You know, we think whether our religion is Christ or social or, 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 or post-Marxism, post, post-modernism and neo-Marxism. They're all religions. You know, the liberal view is, 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 is that, to go back to an earlier point, is that we don't know. You know, and that's the anti-religious point. That's saying, I don't know, let's work it out. That's where... That's what everything comes down to. Can we say to each other, I don't know, let's work it out? You know, not saying, and the religious view is, no, I already know. You know, and I think that's what I think Peterson puts his finger on with a totalitarian view. You know, is that, that it's, he, 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 he made the religious point that the devil is somebody who said they didn't need, or an entity that said they didn't need any knowledge outside of what they knew. You know, that was the beginning and end of reality, is what they knew. There was nothing beyond that. And that, in a strange way, is kind of where we're at. You know, with neo-Marxism and post marxism it's like, you know, the beginning and ending of the world is what I know, and that, that I know it. And I, look at it, I look at it and think, I don't know anything. You know, and that's humility. And, I, and it's very prideful to say you're humble. And I'm not saying I am, but I do think humility is a virtue that should be very much treasured and aimed for, you know, and the idea and the beginnings of humility is to say it's a very, very tough world to understand. People are very complex. The world is very complex. And before you start organising it, have a think about that because you can end up in hell very quickly, you know, and, and, and you might have been born into a generation that didn't know hell. But it's happened time and time and time again throughout history and it could happen very quickly now because of the internet and our interconnectedness. And I don't think, I do think Peterson's right about the academy, i.e. the academic establishment is failing in its duty. You know, I don't think it's teaching people to think in the way that they once did. It's also become part of this, this malevolent kind of limitation of thought, you know, and when, they, when that's happening in the universities, which Peterson has talked a lot about, you know, you are training the next generation of leaders. And that's a dangerous path uh, to go down. And that's the totalitarian mindset. You know, to me, you've got to have humility about what you know. And yet you've also got to have conviction about what you believe. So I have convictions about values. And one of those values is freedom, individual freedom of thought. Now I can't, I can't defend that to you in a logical way except by introspection and thinking what's more precious to me than being able to think what I want to think. I mean the, the evil of the communist societies was you weren't even able to think. And that's kind of the way we're going is that, oh I can't have that thought because it's a misogynist thought or a racist thought, so I won't have that thought, you know, although it might be an interesting thought, you know, and it might not be at all misogynist, it might not be at all racist, but you're scared to have that thought because that little kernel of guilt inside you is activated, you know, and I, I, I think that's, that's a very dangerous place, given how collective we are as a species, how we love to join in with the mob, how we love to believe we're individuals by acting in a very unindividualistic way, how we love to have the approval of all the people around us, how we love to fit in, how we hate to stand out, how we, you know, and all these, this, our very, really, um, what we call it's group nature, tribal nature, you know, is only under the surface, very, and it's getting closer and closer to the surface, that tribalism. Which is, which is the opposite, really, of Enlightenment values, and says, no, we're not just a bunch of tribes. We're precious individuals. Yeah, this is, this is something I fear, because I, my sense is that some lessons have to be learned the hard way. And I have a sense that it's the, 
a big thing that, that, that we have lost is the lived experience of those who learnt those lessons the hard way, the Second World War generation. And that's what I fear is that it's now a whole lifetime since the, since the lessons were learned the hard way in the Second World War. And what we're seeing is as we lose that sort of sense of those lessons being learned and all of the structures that were built up after the Second World War, that we may have to learn those lessons again the hard way. And that's Maybe what I see coming. one could also ask that question about the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, which is much more recent, you know, and, and that's, uh, that's um, my maths is as bad as you, but that was 40 years later than the, than the end of the Second World War. There's plenty of people who survived that, you know, who, who've, um, who can give their testimony to where that way of thinking lies. And you only have to pick up by, by Salts and Etzin to know how those people... But, you know, is he on the list? After all, he's an old white man. Does anyone bother reading him anymore? Why listen to Salts and Etzin when he's an old white man with a beard? You know, because he's got... Why listen to Dostoevsky, you know? He's a, he's a dead, old dead white man. You know, this is bullshit. You know, you listen to voices that have something interesting to say. And once you start saying, well, we don't listen to you because you belong to the wrong ethnic gender group, we don't hear what you've got to say because it's only about power. All you've got to say is tainted by your desire, and which is just, you know, that's a sick way of thinking about the world. It's just not true. It's just not true. Yeah, and I want to pick up the point you made before about humility, because I think that's, a really, that's the really key point. Um, and in my interview with, with Peterson, I asked him, what are the prerequisites for genuine knowledge? And he said, fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And he said, psychologically, that means that what you don't know is more important than what you know. That God, in this sense, is standing in for the, the mystery or the, the, the sum total of the world that you don't know. I, and he I, said that you need, you, need to think, you need to hold that as if your life depended on it. I, I think that's a very important point, and it's something Peterson hasn't talked nearly enough about, which is what he means by God. You know, when people think, oh, he's sort of a Christian or something, well, what does he mean by God? He doesn't make this point, but I've read enough of his stuff and looked at his enough lectures to know exactly what he means by God. What he means by God is all the stuff you don't know and don't understand and the future, which you don't know and understand. Well, that's one meaning of God, I guess. There's two meanings, actually. <laughs> you know, but, but, but that, he doesn't see it as some sort of supernatural entity that's going to guide your outcomes if you believe in him to some happy ending. You know, he says that's the fundamental human orientation towards what they called God at the time of writing the Bible was that thing that they, didn't, they couldn't control, that was really controlling them and that they could bargain with it uh, in the way that you could bargain with the future you know in the way that you bargain with god uh, uh, you know and that you and, and and at the same time the world like god is unknowable so i wish he'd talk a lot more about what the hell he means by god you know i heard him talking to matt de la Hunty about sort of god and taking LSD and I thought no mate you know you're on the wrong track here you know I don't what just just tell them what you think God you know it's not it's not mystical you know it's actually and I don't know really where he stands as, as you know I don't know how much of a Christian he is but I think that really appeals to me that idea you know that the word God is 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 not what we take it to mean and this is how the meaning of the word developed as a powerful and often malevolent force that we have to deal with, you know? And I think that's, um, that's a good definition of God. Which is a great place to end. Yes, <laughs> all right. Thanks very much, David. Thank I really much. enjoyed that, thank you. Yeah.